Okay. Uh, thank you for your patience. So my name is Nathan Haynes, and I'm going to talk about the future of Ubuntu. So just for quick reference, um, I've been using computers for a very, very long time. I'm a computer enthusiast. Uh, I've done some programming, especially in uh, high school, middle school. Uh, you wouldn't call that back then, but uh, I started programming. I'm a gamer, and I'm a computer technician, so I can uh, break them and fix them. Um, it was actually the perfect uh, career to get into because I, I was experimenting with my computer when I was 12. And when you're 12 and you break the family computer, in 1992 when there's a, a 33 megahertz 386 SX with two lanes of RAM and it cost $2,500, you break the family computer you get really good at fixing it until your mom finds out. So, um, so I tried to keep abreast of um, the developments of you know, what makes my computer work and, and what makes it more useful. And so I'm also an author. Now, um, I don't have my book with me there, there in my uh, car actually waiting for the food. Um, but I did write a book uh, this last year called uh, Beginning of Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users. And um, that's my magnum opus at the, uh, at the moment. And I've written tutorial articles and magazines to try and basically um, make things plain. What's really nice about this book is if you're a Windows or Mac user, and, you know, you know if you use a, if you use a, uh, if you use Ubuntu or Linux, just um, so if you learn anything from scratch, it's super easy. You learn all the concepts new. If you're really good at Windows or really good with your Mac, right, and you try Ubuntu, everything's just a little different, and it looks familiar, but it doesn't work the same way, and that can be really confusing and really frustrating because you're a computer expert, but not with you're not an Ubuntu expert. So. This book bridges the gap between um, everything you already know how to use computer and get you started on the right step. So um, uh, we will have a copy of the booth to, uh, a book at the booth to uh, flip through if you have any questions. Um, it's also available online through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and through A-Press. And um, I am giving, I wrote this book, 100% wrote the book, all the screenshots, everything, editing, revision, in Ubuntu. So uh, I'll talk about that more in my talk um, Saturday night. Uh, I think it so if you want to know more about uh, the process of publishing using free software, come to that talk. If you want to know more about the booth, uh, come see, or about the book, I'm sorry, come see me at the Ubuntu booth and I'll talk more about that. But what you actually wanted uh, to hear about today was the future of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu, as we know, is a desktop operating system. It's probably the best desktop solution that exists. It's a complete solution for your computer. Uh, it's always kept secure and up to date if you, if you choose an LTS version. Five years of security updates on the desktop, you run a server, five years of security updates. So it's um, it's a really wonderful, stable platform to work on. And of course, it's built entirely on free, using free and open source software other than some firmware bits uh, because sometimes we like to have video display. Um, it's a really, really nice system to use. And in the past couple of years, Canonical and the Ubuntu community have started working on expanding the reach of Ubuntu. Now, uh, many of us think of Ubuntu as a desktop OS, and some of us are, are uh, fortunate enough to use it as a server, because if you want server stuff, Ubuntu is the best. Raise your hand, who here uses it as a desktop OS? Pretty much everyone. Um, who here uses it on the server? Also pretty much everyone. So uh, who here uses it on their phone? Cur currently. Um, Ubuntu developers, yes. So uh, what has happened is that there's this great push to, um, to have Ubuntu on the phone. And if you haven't seen Ubuntu on the phone, if you've only seen um, uh, uh, web articles, come by the Ubuntu booth. We have Ubuntu phones. Best thing ever. They, they, um, it sounds like an interesting idea, but when you hold your hand and try it, it's really cool. So all this work has been put into a phone. And so uh, a lot of websites, news websites, like to say that you know Ubuntu has abandoned the desktop and is not developing on the desktop, and we're only working on the phone. And that's not quite the case. There's been a focus on some new technologies, but it's all going to come together uh, very, very shortly. So what happens is that is that the way Ubuntu is made is changing. 
So let's look at the desktop. Now, the desktop operating system today is made by taking the Debian archive. Debian is a Linux distro that, um, that precedes Ubuntu, and we take that entire uh, uh, repository, all that software in Debian, and when we have a new release of Ubuntu, we start syncing all that software every day until about three months in, three months from the release of uh, the next version of Ubuntu. We stop automatically pulling all the changes, and we start selectively grabbing this and that, double checking, polishing every, everything, getting rid of all the bugs, doing that Ubuntu special uh, polish that we like to add. And we are able to have from a repository of, of 75,000 software packages, we're, we're able to put about 10,000 into a desktop operating system. And so in Debian, in Ubuntu, software is packaged up in a Debian package. And what that is, is, um, well, it starts with the source package. It's all the source code that you, you can, you can um, manually or automatically, obviously, we automatically build and compile the programs from that source code. And so what Ubuntu does, uh, Debian supports a billion different computer architectures. Ubuntu only supports a couple, but we support, for example, 32-bit uh, Intel, 64-bit Intel, and AMD, uh, and uh, ARM, 32 and 64-bit ARM, and some other stuff. But we, we build all, those, all these packages for these different, different components. And so that gives us a binary package. So what that is is if we want to install a specific piece of software, we need the package and we run the tool and it installs automatically with some scripts and stuff, instructions, the exact same things that you would have to do if you did it by hand, we just have the computer do it automatically. And so what happens is that we have 75,000 software packages out there. So when we want to build an Ubuntu desktop system, that's what happens. We start with, we need the Linux kernel. And that's in the package. So we can take that package and we can install that on a blank file system. And then we need the, um, we need, uh, there's initial runtime interface, there's the init system, there's the community user space that does all the, there's bash, it gives us all that beautiful terminal goodness that everybody loves. Um, and then, of course, we need, um, for a desktop system, we need the desktop. So we need the X display server. That's across a dozen different packages. We need uh, the GNOME uh, desktop environment. So that gives us Nautilus, which is our file manager, uh, gedit for a text editor. Uh, all the cut, copy, paste stuff is actually GNOME. Then we need Unity. So Unity 7 is a bunch of packages. That gives us that beautiful interface, clean interface you see there. Um, the top panel, each of those icons is another uh, indicator uh, applet that's a separate package for every single thing. And so bit by bit, like Lego instructions, um, not the little mini kits, I mean the, the giant $200 uh, collector's edition, you know, uh, 3,000 piece kits, we build an operating system bit by bit, package by package, until we have, until we have a working system. And that's how the desktop gets to you today. Now, when it comes time to actually install, uh, what we figured out is that, so if, if you go back, if you if you go to old-releases.ubuntu.com and you get Ubuntu, I would say 504 or 510 would probably be the earliest you can get to where it's really easy to install. And you run through an installer, it's a text-based installer, and you can answer some questions, and uh, maybe in a virtual machine, right? And it will start installing. And you'll see it's, it's installing, uncompressing, package this, installing this. It's actually literally building that on your system. Well, we have this live environment, and we have, have a DVD. You are actually running Ubuntu off the disk. And so it's a full, complete, working desktop system that we've already built, it's just, just like you would have on a system. So um, years ago, we decided, well, we have a new working Ubuntu system. Let's copy everything over, and then just use the package system to uninstall Ubiquity installer, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we don't need because it's on, you know, we need on the desktop system. So the Ubuntu is built package by package, but when we install it, we actually do have an image that we're getting onto our computer and then we just do some tweaks. And um, so the Ubuntu is actually installed, it's almost like an image based install, but, but by core, everything's built piece by piece. So that works beautifully for, beautifully for a desktop. And what happens is that um, you install everything, you log in, you have your user account, and when you want more software, you go in, 
uh, to the software center, or you go to the command line, sudo apt install, and you type your package name. It downloads a single package, and it decompresses it, and it uses the script to put these binary files in um, uh, slash user slash bin, it puts all the documentation graphics in slash user slash share, and it writes into the, your file system. It's all one disk. It starts throwing files all over the system according to uh, Unix tradition, and puts things everywhere, and modifies your main system. So occasionally, when something goes wrong, uh, there's a bug in a, in a program, an installer or something, we can break things because the system is, is modifiable. So we wanted about three years ago, we started working, or we, well, I guess other people in Canonical were working on phones beforehand, but we announced that we're going to do an Ubuntu phone. And the phones are incredible. Like I said, you really need to come by the booth. They are really fantastic. So the phone has a bold new look and vision, has a brand new design that's clean, that's sharp, that looks like a Ubuntu, and also gives us the exact same interface. So for example, we have um, full screen apps, all large. The neat thing about this is that the music app, for example, the one program also runs on a desktop computer. The Ubuntu on the phone is also the same as Ubuntu on the desktop. But there are some differences in how it's built. So when we have a computer that doesn't come with Ubuntu, and we install things, and we, you know, we, we add new programs, and we modify things, right? We can break computers. And in fact, like I said, I'm a computer technician. And the reason I'm so good at that, I've been doing it professionally for 18 years, is because when I was little, I would break my system and immediately learn how to fix it um, by pain of having my computer taken away because it was a family computer system. The best way to learn uh, somehow how things work is to break them and then have to fix them, uh, even if under duress. So it's a great thing for computers because if I break my Ubuntu system, hopefully a virtual machine, not my actual uh, work system, uh, I can just start from scratch. I grab the disk or the USB key, stick it in there, reboot, install, and Ubuntu installs down to like 20 minutes, flat, done, and I'm all set, up and running, and it's, it's all set. But if you, have a, if you walk into a store, buy an Ubuntu phone, walk out with a phone, and you install some software, have an update, and it breaks the phone, the answer cannot be no sweat. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your computer, I hope it's running Ubuntu, you're gonna go to the website, you're gonna download this image, you're gonna open the terminal, you're gonna uh, take your phone, plug it in, you're gonna add this, uh, the vendor ID to the USB, the new dev rules, then you're gonna go and type Ubuntu device flash, and then you do this. That's the wrong answer for a phone, right? You can't, you can't, we have this breaking. So it's been very rare that an Ubuntu update's bro uh, is broken a desktop system, or well, it has happened once or twice. Uh, if anyone remembers the, uh, the great uh, X debacle of, uh, uh, 2006 um, has happened before. Um, so phones had to be different. So the way the phone system is, is, is built is that uh, it's a fundamentally different design. On the desktop, you have one file system. You have your, your hard drive, your partition. Your file system's writable, and it is protected. You have to have uh, you have to use sudo to, or, or have admin access to write to your file system. But when you install a program, it writes all over your system. It can be modified. The phone is completely different. The way the phone works is that we start with a with a uh, base Ubuntu system. That's a, a system image, and it's it's uh, it's the same as Ubuntu. We we uh, get all the basic packages and build it into a system image and stick that on the phone. Then we take that and uh, we have a user writable partition, and so the system image is not modifiable want to upgrade your system, uh, the system will download the update, and then reboot, make the changes, and when it reboots into Ubuntu, you cannot make any changes. Everything, everything else happens on top of that. And so, uh, so the desktop uses Debian packages, and the phone uses what are called Click packages. They're super lightweight. They don't have, you know, if you install a Debian package, uh, it, will, it knows all the other things that it might need to, to run. So when you have Ubuntu, uh, if you install the Ubuntu-desktop package, it installs like 10,000 packages because that's all the stuff it needs to run. Click package is one thing 
that uh, doesn't depend on anything else. It has everything it needs to build it. And uh, the, 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 the system on phone is one specific thing because it's an image, it can't be changed. So if you're a developer writing an application, you know exactly what Ubuntu on the phone is going to look like. On Ubuntu on the desktop, you can have all kinds of things installed or not installed. So people like to install Ubuntu and then take out all the extra packages, which is fine. But so a de developer on the desktop can't assume that something's installed. On the phone, you know there's a baseline there. And so the other problem, of course, is uh, everyone here's used Android phones, right? And you, you have Android, and you, you install apps. It says it needs these permissions. It needs to know your uh, access to uh, your call state, whether you're making calls, uh, your location, all your contacts, your social security number, once your routing number, right? And they all blanket permissions that you have to add, you know. And so maybe you say, why does this stupid game have to know um, if I'm on a call, who I'm calling, right? Well, it doesn't. But it may want to know um, if you're on a call. If the phone rings, the game can say, oh, I'll pause. Or all music player will say, I'll mute. But in Android, 5.0 and less, it's, it's one big giant, I know everything about calls. Whereas, on the, uh, in Android 6.0 they fixed this, but um, it, it took them a while, but they, they got there. On Ubuntu, um, so, so what happens is it's really easy to make things so that you have, a, uh, you have applications that can access all sorts of different things. So Ubuntu is designed differently. Ubuntu is designed to be secure just, just by default. So the way Ubuntu works is that these quick applications uh, come in and they're placed in one location. Everything they need is under, under that uh, directory. And those quick applications are not allowed to access anything outside of that directory. You just can't do it. If you try, you just get access to that error. So um, what happens is that you download something and if you need to access, if it needs to access the, your location, it can't access the, the uh, the device file that, that goes to GPS chipset, it has to ask the Ubuntu framework, and then you get a little prompt saying, would you like to allow this? Um, if you have an app that wants to access all your personal information in your banking app, it can't do it. The Ubuntu framework doesn't let it, and if it tries to just uh, scan your other other files for uh, your directory tree to see what's in there, it doesn't see anything. You only see what's in there. So by sandboxing those apps, uh, we, we create an experience that's secure by default and can't be circumvented. And so when you are developing an app for Ubuntu, you get everything done, ready, you say what permissions you need. For example, uh, you, you need network access or you need to be able to, uh, to uh, get location, for example. Um, and then you upload it to the store and uh, check runs and make sure everything compiles and it's all set. And then done. 20 seconds later, it's in the store for everyone to, to access because uh, it doesn't need to be checked manually. The system can find something you know secure. Um, now, you, it might be uploading everything you type into Russia or China or you know some other place, but um, it can never access any information outside of itself. So what happened was that we, we devised a system that was sort of all, all together, all in one, and that's really useful for a lot of different so some interesting things start to happen. Now, one of the promises of uh, the phone was that because it is running Ubuntu uh, for real Ubuntu, that that phone's going to be able to uh, to sort of um, well, you can run like I said, this music player, for example, runs on the desktop as well, and it's actually uh, it's actually quite nice on the desktop. So the design vision for the Ubuntu phone was designed to have these big bold iconic designs that are super easy to use on, on a touch screen. But designed such that with more space and a keyboard and mouse and a larger monitor, that the design uh, could dynamically change to a desktop style interface. Just like websites, some websites uh, nowadays, the same code, the same page. Uh, it could be a desktop design. If you take your browser and shrink it down like a phone, it switches to a mobile interface. And the Ubuntu apps uh, are written the same way now. So on a desktop, this is my Nexus 7 Android tablet, a uh, screenshot from that. Uh, this was actually taken uh, for my book. It's, it's a little uh, more refined nowadays. But 
this music player here is the exact same music player as you saw uh, beforehand. Full screen, easy to go through. The uh, uh, casperture is designed for a touch screen. Where you can slide everything around, swipe away things you don't want to run, and so on. But on the desktop, it's a full screen, a full screen uh, music app. And as the music app is uh, continues to evolve, it actually looks even more desktop-y. Um, but it's the exact same code. So a developer can write a program once and run it on any device, whether it's a phone, desktop, laptop, tablet, doesn't matter. The same program runs, but it will adapt to, to, to meet that those needs. So this, uh, this interface, this style of building things was actually turned out pretty useful. Now there's one other way that uh, Linux is sort of taking over and is really one of the best ways to, um, to develop. And that's also for what's called the Internet of Things. And so what that means is that if you have a, a router, for example, or if you buy a Linksys router, a Belkin router, they're actually running Linux. And just like uh, all the phones, there's a system image, so you have a firmware update, right? It's actually a little Linux system running a little web server, some web apps and stuff that gives you the, so when you log into your router, it's the actual web interface. It's running Linux underneath for all the networking stuff. And then they build a little web server, and then they build a little uh, web app stuff to configure it. Well, when you want to update some, so nothing can be changed. So when you want to update something, um, they have to take an image. It works just like, like we build Ubuntu. Tons of packages everywhere, here and there. You build one thing, and then get it rock solid and send it out. So what happens is that when there's um, a bug found in the Linux kernel that may be a security exploit, uh, it's a lot of work. They have to rebuild the entire system to fix one thing that maybe, you know, or maybe they want to update the web interface design or there's a bug there it doesn't doesn't change the setting correctly. They have to rebuild the entire system and get that ready, test it all, send it out. So this is so, but but the, the routers and so on also use Linux, a lot of drones use Linux, because anything, Linux is a, is a powerful networking operating system. It's pretty standard if you develop on one disk or works everywhere. So there's something new that came out, and that's called uh, Snappy UBB Core. And they took what they learned from the system they developed for the phone and said, we can make this bigger and better, and we can make it so it really pertains to everything, so that we can sort of generalize this and make it more powerful. So this is like the phone, this is like Click 2.0 they used to call it way back in the day. So this is how this works. And, and the phone, um, even more towards the end of the year, is going to actually switch to use this exact same architecture. And we're going to be able to build a desktop on it as well. So the way this works is that you have the system image. And the way it works now is for each device, you have a couple packages. You have a system image and you have some hardware stuff. Let me make that generic. So um, say you have a computer. You're going to have a Ubuntu core, which is a uh, read-only little image of all the files in, in Ubuntu, or that version of Ubuntu. And because computers have different hardware, uh, routers have different hardware, um, you're going to take this image that's all the stuff that you depend on as a developer, and have an, what's called an, 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 an enablement, or a gadget staff is what they're calling it now. And so that's all the firmware and drivers and everything that plugs in. So a hardware vendor will design all that uh, for their router, for their drone, and so on. And so they have just a little bit to do here, and then that doesn't have to change. This Ubuntu core comes from the Ubuntu community, it comes from Canonical. And on top of that, they can build um, applications. And so there's two kinds of snaps. So for example, in this system, uh, if you wanted uh, to run a little graphical display, if you're run, running a little, uh, maybe a, a phone or uh, a gadget with a little LCD display, you install a framework. You install probably the mirror framework, which is the graphical subsystem that replaces X. And then on top of that, you, you, run, you run apps. And just like the phone, with Ubuntu Core, this is read-only and cannot be changed. So is this. And so these, this foundation can uh, have the hardware support for Ubuntu. So a new device, can, you can import Ubuntu to a new device really, really quickly. Then when you write an application, um, you're writing, uh, you're creating and packaging the snap that goes on top of everything else. Now the, 
this is where everything's really cool. When you have an Ubuntu core system, you know exactly what's going to be there. And so when you run a, write a, an application, uh, you can be assured that it will run on any Ubuntu core system. So if you're, um, so this is, this is actually a uh, Raspberry Pi running, um, or would be a Raspberry Pi running Ubuntu. And so, uh, core, and you can actually access uh, a, a list of store that can that can install different snaps. So this is just what's installed by default. If you wanted a web server, you could go to the store and install a web server snap. If you wanted, um, if you had like routing, someone makes a routing network configuration thing, then you can you can take that routing information. So a router manufacturer can take the Ubuntu core, and build some router stuff on top. Take an old computer, you can make a router out of it by installing a Ubuntu Core and installing a router package on top of things. Things are really, really easy. Um, a lot of this functionality is available to any device. And so uh, we have vendors right now who are making uh, products based on snappy Ubuntu Core. That are, for example, uh, I think at the Ubuntu booth, we'll have a, uh, a spider drone by Earl. And it runs Ubuntu. And everything you can find in the Ubuntu store for snappy a lot of things yet because we're still still in the nascent, uh, nascent uh, stages. Um, if you wanted a web server on that drone for some reason, you can install a web server. You go to the uh, Snap Store, download it, install it, done. It's really easy to do. And then maybe you could um, you could log into the uh, to the network onto the drone, type in a little web interface stuff, and then the drone can be crawling around doing whatever it's doing. And you can have a nice web interface that's maybe sending back a vi video from a video camera you attached, or maybe you wrote a little web app that controls it, so you can actually use a, uh, a web interface and move it forward and backwards. And in fact, in one of the demos, uh, I think that Mark Shuttleworth did, uh, I think they had an app that read uh, a Twitter feed, so you could hashtag uh, so-and-so left and right, and you could actually control while he was talking, control what the drone moved back and forth, and um, the audience walked it off the table. Um, but you can build everything, you know, uh, in a standard way. And so what's going to end up happening, so there's, the complaint is that the Ubuntu's focused just on the phone to the exclusion of everything else. The technologies that were developed for the phone to allow it to be Ubuntu, but still work as a desktop, are going to come together so that the phone uh, can be built using Ubuntu Core. So the base doesn't change. It'll be a mirror framework, a desktop framework, and some snaps, and everything will be built on top. And there'll be a, a, a sort of a confined area for legacy applications. Right. So you'll be able to take, uh, you'll be able to have a desktop built on Ubuntu Core that the system cannot be modified, so you can't get viruses, you can't have malware, you can't have uh, spyware, because any confined app will only be able to access its own data. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking to crawl through everything else. The other thing is because snap packages are confined, you're going to be able to, so right now, if you have LibreOffice, it's like 20, 30 different packages, and it's this and that, and that spell checking library, and all these different libraries, uh, plus the graphical framework. So when a new version of LibreOffice comes out, it's really difficult to package it to make sure it's compatible, because uh, Ubuntu doesn't change much with releases. So, um, newer versions of LibreOffice might need newer versions of components. And you're sort of out of luck. It's really tricky to make to manage everything. The Snappy Ubuntu Core, every snap is confined, so LibreOffice is going to be able to put everything it needs in its snap, for example. So when a new version of LibreOffice comes out, it can build a snap for Ubuntu. And because that snap doesn't write files all over the, the, the base system, it can't remember it's the Um You can get new versions of applications. So when the desktop moves to Ubuntu Core, uh, it will be possible to get uh, newer updates of applications far longer than, far more than you usually would. So uh, Ubuntu Core 4, for example, is stuck in a ver certain version of LibreOffice, and you'll get minor security fixes, but I think the version in 4.4, I think it was 4.3, I think, is end of life. So Libra LibreOffice is working on 5.0 and um, that wouldn't be a problem with Ubuntu Core. So by taking what we learned from the phone, and we're, we're evolving for all devices, we can make a better desktop that's 
more secure, and much, much more versatile. And in fact, if you were working on uh, a, uh, a router or a, uh, or a drone or a robot or a Raspberry Pi, you can develop everything and build it on your laptop computer, install it on your laptop, laptop computer, test it, and everything works out great, you're all set. Then you can start, you get it all mostly working, then you can start sending it to your, your uh, Raspberry Pi or so on and testing it on the device. But you can do development testing on the desktop laptop as well because everything is the, the environment's the exact same, same, uh, same thing. And um, so Ubuntu really becomes one operating system that's the same on every device. Now, the good thing is that uh, the technology is being developed right now to enable legacy applications and Debian packages to run on this Ubuntu core system. And so that's going to enable uh, legacy des desktop applications to run on this phone. And I don't know for sure now at the, the booth, Canonical has been really quiet about, uh, about um, I've been trying to harass someone to, to take my tablet and run legacy apps, um, because I'm, I've been busy, not lazy, busy, too busy to get all the instructions. Um, but it, it does run legacy apps. And we're gonna make it so it's like clockwork. You hardly know the difference. Um, but that same technology will also allow, allow the same, uh, same apps to run on the desktop. Now, the, so the desktop become more secure, and you get newer versions of Ubuntu. Now, the best thing is, is that the current Debian-based system, where you just install anything you want, is not going away. Couldn't. One, that's how we build these images. Two, well, that's how we obviously fix things before they go in the images. And so um, that's always going to be a, a possibility. But we're also going to have the, um, the ability to take the security improvements um, and that, that we get from the phone and have that secure, solid, trustworthy system. On the phone, on the desktop, anywhere. So, uh, and then uh, for our embedded devices, especially as more and more devices start talking to the internet, they're internet connected, you have the internet connected home, the thermostat can talk to the freezer, the, you know, there's all sorts of things. Um, that's going to be safe and secure and reliable and easy to develop for because of Ubuntu and because of this shared infrastructure, it also makes, uh, it makes it easier for different manufacturers to work together, even on different devices, so they can communicate. So the next time that you hear that Ubuntu has developed or has abandoned the desktop, you know that all the hard work we put in on the phone, which has gotten way more stable, uh, actually, uh, because of all the work and automated testing we do for all the phone packages, um, has made the desktop more stable, sort of more boring, because nothing breaks. Um, all the benefits that, that the phone is seeing are coming to the desktop to you in a real direct way. So with that, I'd like to open uh, everything up to questions from the audience. So uh, I think we have a microphone runner. Two questions back there. Uh, I, sorry, I think ready. How will the, okay. How will the phone handle VMs? So the, that's a good question. So the phone itself um, can, um, the phone uses what's called containers, or we'll shortly use containers. So they're like VMs, it shares the same kernel, it's not a completely different operating system, but it's isolated. Uh, so that'll help different processes, different programs kind of be completely separate from each other. But uh, the phone itself, um, I don't know what virtualization, so the phone's running an ARM processor. I don't know what virtualization solutions are on ARM, uh, but probably, probably QMU. Um, should just work. If you wanted to do that today, you'd uh, set up a, a Cheroot environment, and then in there, and do app get installed, so on, put everything in there, and you can run it in that little confined spot. It'd be a little, a little hacky at first, but um, uh, they weren't designed to run tons of VMs. But it is something you do, because all the technology is software. If, if there's a good QMU uh, uh, virtualization software. So, and then if, if, if that catches on, somebody will write a, a, a click app or snap app that, that manages that and makes it easy. But uh, one, you're next. Pardon me. What about uh, shared things like uh, Java? Will that be inside each container or will it be a shared resource that all of them can access? So uh, every, every snap is completely self-contained. So uh, yeah, if uh, something uses Java, they'll package their own version of Java or their own version of Python in there, um, which seems like a waste, but um, there'll be some deduplication software. 
uh, that can kind of shrink things on the, on, the, on the phone or the device. And then you don't have version conflicts with this version of Java and that version of Java or that version of Python. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, oh, one other thing is that because we, have, we know exactly what the system image, image is going to be, so if I do a system update on my phone, it's the entire full thing, but when I download, I uh, think it might be two megabytes because only the changes are downloaded. And we can, we can guarantee that because we know exactly what the last version of the Adventure System image, image is. And so when we install, we, we can install just, download just the changes. And in fact, Adventure Snappy, uh, uh, Snappy Adventure Core actually uh, will install, when you do update, it'll install to a second partition. When you reboot, it boots into the new partition. If that doesn't boot, you reset your system, it boots back into the older version. Uh, plus, you can always revert back. So um, you can, it's really easy to, um, to upgrade and downgrade applications. If it doesn't work out, you can always revert back. You always have a known state. Um, you can never get in the, into the situation with Ubuntu uh, desktop uh, where you kind of have a half install thing and it failed and you have half install and you don't know what's going on. It's all uh, stateful, so it's common. It's really we have a question. Uh, um, next question here. Uh, actually, we have, he was next. Oh, sorry. So, all right, so you asked your question if you promise that he gets it next, okay? Sure. Uh, two, actually, two quickies. One, I was trying to understand what's the difference between Snappy and containers. Are Snappy instantiating in a container, or am I just confused there? And then secondly, um, just I'm surprised by no mention of tablets or sort of Chromebooky type things. Is that possible with this framework, or is I missing something there, too? It's totally possible. Um, my my uh, Nexus 7 is running, in, it's dual boots, but it's running Ubuntu, and it works great. Um, because we just have phone shipping, which will change uh, later this year, uh, they kind of let the tablet UI, the extended UI, the side stage, so on, kind of not go no, went nowhere. Um, I hope that changes in the next couple months because by the time the tablets ship or in stores, that's they will have changed. Um, since I'm just using whatever and I'm not developing, I, I'm leeching on others' work, and enjoying others' contributions. Um, the tablet's actually really nice and a little rough edges, but if I sync my Bluetooth mouse or keyboard, it flips to a desktop app uh, interface. It's really, really nice. Snappy is um, not containers per se, although I think they're moving towards that uh, a little more. Uh, what Snappy is, is it uses app armor to isolate uh, system access, so um, uh, it's like its own little sandbox. And then certain things, uh, I think, who are going to start using, start instantiating separate Linux containers for each app. I think a lot of the legacy apps are going to do that, uh, uh, that are running on Snappy. That were not designed for Snappy, but are running Snappy, I think are going to be He actually asked both of my questions because the devices, is, you know, talking a little bit more about that. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. The, the phone already the, because of the responsive design. Um, the phone OS running a tablet looks really well with a few rough edges because it's it's trying to do more phony things, right? But um, they would be really quick to polish out. And it's just that we've been trying to get the phone. There are phones in people's hands to make sure those are absolutely perfect. Now's the perfect time to start working. With I have two uh, small questions. So the Snappy core, um, is that supposed to scale up from Internet of Things devices, small embedded devices, to desktops? Um, that's going to have to be pretty small, right? Yeah, uh, I think I think it's like 60. So they want 4 gigabytes of A and B partitions and so on for the OS. But, but the actual contents of, of, of the uh, OS core, I think, are like 65 or 70 megabytes. Super tiny. And that's something with an Ubuntu server disk. You can right now go pop in, or they take the image, pop into a virtual machine, uh, and then when the bootloader comes up, you uh, do uh, the other options and say minimal install. And you get a teeny tiny install. There's, that's already available today. This is going to be a standardized thing that's easy to upgrade, that's uh, read only, so it's more secure. And the other thing is um, if, if you have these Snap uh, packages that are packaging all of their dependencies, JVM or Python um, runtime and all that stuff. Um, they could be rather large. Um, are you going to do the, the diff between the pa package updates just like the core so that you don't have to download an entire new JVM every time? I think that's the plan. And I, I hope that is. Um, it's not there yet. Um, they're also uh, on the disk with storage space. They're looking at uh, deduplication uh, 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 methods. 
Yeah, I think the idea is that once everything's up and running, hopefully for 1604, um, when you have the Snap Store, yeah, anything you download from the store should be uh, a binary. The system already works that way. I think that's in the plan for uh, user submitted, community submitted snaps. It's a little harder, but I think that's in the works. But it would definitely be possible um, if it's not in the works today. I think it is. Any other questions? So, like I said, the, the clickbait is, you know, you abandon the desktop, but um, it's not true. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Will it work well with external storage? Uh, yes. There's, um, there, yes, there's, uh, I'm trying to think exactly how you do that, um, not by default, but there are, so the other way, so the way the phone works is right now, a, a phone app can only access its own, only its stuff, right? So if you want to... If you run Deco, the email client, and you want to send someone a picture, well, you can't access any pictures. It can't run through your home directory. So uh, Deco will ask the uh, Ubuntu SDK um, for, uh, say, I need a picture. And it will come up with every app that has pictures and the app to present it. Sort of like an Android, right? So worst case scenario, um, yes, there, there will be helper apps that help move things between snaps and, and make that content available in a way that's the same every single time prompts you, it can't be done through such subterfuge, right? Because the program itself can't ask it asks the trusted system helper. Um, and in the and in the capabilities for the snaps when you program everything, you say I need this, I need that, you can specify specific things you're looking for, certain hardware access, certain things that you can verify when you at install time. So yeah, external storage will definitely work. The memory specs? Um, so if you go to Ubuntu.com slash things, uh, there'll be a little more information. I know it needs at least uh, 4 gigabytes of storage. I think 8 is what it, re it uh, recommends, 4 for the OS and then 4 for the storage. Memory is really, really, really minimal. Uh, I'd, be I'd be surprised if 128 isn't, isn't uh, possible. Maybe a little less if you're careful, but I don't know off the top of my head. Ubuntu.com slash things gives you that specific information just for devices. A question: Could you um, dual boot between, say, Snappy and Android on a phone? In theory, if someone so, ARM devices aren't like PCs, which is a BIOS and standard everything. Every ARM device is completely different. Different UIF. If you're lucky, there's, there's all sorts of things. So, it's there's no guarantees. But um, uh, yeah, my Nexus Seven, for example, can boot between Android and Ubuntu. Uh, my Nexus Five used to be able to. Then, then I upgraded to Android Six Point Zero, and it's I'm too lazy to figure out how, so um, it's more or less easy. But on the desktop, it should be pretty simple. On uh, devices, it's it's per device and can be kind of hard. Are you guys also developing for the Intel mobile platform, like the Atoms and such that are going in phones? Um, I don't know. To be honest, that's a good question. You should come uh, to the Ubuntu booth where we will have uh, people from Canonical to, to answer that kind of question. So um, yeah, so it's so it's uh, on my chance that um, yeah it uh, it it, uh, it works a lot of times. If you try it, you break it, you get to keep both pieces. Um, as with all these things, but um, yeah, and of course as as, as more. So the best thing as well with the enablement uh, is that if um, with all the work on if enthusiasts want to work on just this bit for their favorite device. It is super. I've seen on the developments like Beagle, uh, the Beagle board has different things. The Raspberry Pi would had uh, enablement before it was sufficiently supported. If somebody wants to do it, this makes it so much easier because all, all of the hardware specific stuff is just in a gadget snap. So it, ironically, it makes it even easier. So um, it's hard work, but uh, everything's open. And um, the Snappy developers are really happy to help developers, um, Storm developers, get up and running. They've been really, really nice. Uh, on free note, it's uh, I think hash snappy. I think is a good starting point, as well as the mailing list. So, so uh, we have uh, another question. Question. Yes. Um, 
so right. Um, do you have a time frame, or do you know what the time frame is for bringing the Snappy Core technology to the desktop? Um, I believe the goal is to um, have a Snappy 1.0 for Ubuntu 16.04 LTS. I don't know if Snappy is going to be LTS exactly, but, but that's the release. So the timeline given in, in November by the people working on it, not me, but the people doing the hard work, um, was that um, once we have Snappy 1.0, May or June is where we would start to see the first developer preview of uh, what's called uh, Ubuntu uh, or Snappy Personal, which is Snappy Ubuntu Core with the personal desktop and everything that you can start to test out. And hopefully by 16.10 you have something where it's ready to go because all of this technology is going to make it really easy to switch over from X to Mir to use uh, containers in X and Mir to run all old legacy applications on that new, completely new uh, framework and have everything run really seamlessly. So with any luck, um, 1610, I can't imagine it being later than 1704, but I think 1610 is where we're going to start to see that. And if you're, and if you're uh, feeling adventurous, I think you'll have a chance to preview it in May or June. So uh, I think that's basically it for time. If you have any other questions, you can definitely um, come by the Ubuntu booth. We'll be open Friday from 2 to 6. Saturday from 10 to 6, and then Sunday from 10 to 2. Uh, we'd be happy to answer your questions. We have, uh, we're going to have Raspberry Pis. I think, I think we have a Droid. Um, I think they're able to send that. We're going to have devices that run even just Snappy Core. We're going to have an orange box. You can answer questions with the cloud, the laptops. We have System76 devices. We have a Dell XPS 13 developer device. There's a lot. Oh, plus we have uh, BQ uh, phones and uh, Nexus 4s running convergence stuff. And we're going to have a demo where you can see a phone running desktop uh, desktop interface and demo convergence. Um, we'll be on hand to answer all those questions. So if you are interested in Ubuntu or Ubuntu hardware, the booth is the place to be. So thanks for coming to my talk, and I hope you enjoy all that Scale has to offer.